Listen to AM 560 The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM 560 mobile app, on your Alexa powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. So have reports of the Chinese communist imminent global takeover been greatly exaggerated? In 2022, China lost population for the first time in 60 years. Well, it's a big deal. Its GDP growth in the fourth quarter was revised down. Its population is aging. That has been happening for some time since they pursued the ghastly one-child policy for uh, some three decades and then moved up up to the two-child policy. Not working. If that's all true, should we care? Still has 1.4 billion people, major uh, trading partner, if you will, of the United States. I mean, other than at, at a you know human level, persecution of Uyghur Muslims and Chinese residents, generally speaking, Chinese citizens, generally speaking, at the hands of the communists. Obviously, we care about that. But should we care about uh, China's relative standing in the world, its economic importance, if that diminishes? To help us answer that question, we're pleased to be joined by Simone Gao, journalist and host of Zooming In with Simone Gao, a current affairs program on YouTube. Simone, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So what does uh, what do these um, uh, indicators of, well, decline, if you will, what do they tell us about where President Xi and the Chinese communists currently find themselves? Yes, China's economy is in big trouble. Uh, just like what you said, you know, the overall uh, GDP last year, 2022, was just at 3.2%, well below the projected 5.5%. And most people think this is caused by the pandemic and China's zero COVID policy. So after China terminates zero COVID, the economy should recover quickly. Uh, this is true to some degree, but zero COVID travel, I mean, but, you know, after zero COVID, um, you know, travel, entertainment and catering will pick up to a certain degree, but it won't lift a $18 trillion economy. Um, I would even argue that the termination of zero COVID can only make people understand the truth of China's economy, because now you don't have an excuse to say our economy is bad. Um, I think the real reason behind China's growth stagnation are these. First, the long-term structural problems of China's economy, namely low consumption, over-reliance on government investment, real estate and export. And second, um, you know, China's growth dividend is disappearing just like uh, other emerging com uh, emerging economies uh, namely the population and urbanization di dividend and third xi jinping's policies have wrecked uh, several industries including uh, the real estate industries um and fourth the overall geopolitical environment um is becoming increasingly hostile to the communist china all of these things, except for Xi Jinping's own policies, are extremely hard to fix, uh, or it cannot be fixed at all. So, for example, China has low consumption. The fundamental reason behind that is because the wealth structure of the Chinese population. You know, in China, the top 10% of the Chinese population's net worth accounts for 68% of the total wealth, while the bottom 50% accounts for just 6.3% 6 uh, 6 of total wealth. As Premier Li Keqiang said um, last year, China has 600 million people whose average monthly income is about 1,000 yuan. How much is that? That's roughly $145 hmm. per month. And that's, you, you can't even pay, you can't even afford a decent rent in, in the, medium-sized city in China with that well, this, income. 
Well, this has always yeah. been this has always been the fundamental contradiction, as was it was as was it as it was with the Soviet Union, which is I mean, so we have a bigger economy than China and one fifth the population. Why? Because the government controls the means of production. People don't appreciate that China is largely an agrarian economy, and you speaks to that with the number of people that, uh, as you say, are living on one hundred forty five dollars and and uh, uh, monthly income and. Uh, and so those internal contradictions, ultimately, they it spelled the end of the Soviet Union. And at the end, the death throes, it was Gorbachev pursuing the glass-nosed and perestroika policies in an attempt to save Russia, even uh, Soviet Union, even though it sort of hastened its demise. Do we have the same thing in early stages in China? Because I I note that there were some senior Chinese communist officials that were talking about China being a more open society. We're going to move in that direction. They, they, China is a force for peace in the world. It sounded uh, somewhat similar to what you heard from the Soviets, uh, you know, about a decade before the wall came down. That's a very, that's an extremely important question. I think uh, there's a very important understanding we need to have. And that is, um, um, you know, whenever China, the fundamental motivation and goal of the Chinese Communist Party's uh, reform and opening up is not for the benefit of the Chinese people. I mean, it it, it benefits the Chinese people uh, in, I mean, in certain period. But the fundamental goal of that reform and opening up is to maintain the communist rule. And this is made very clear, not only to the, uh, the, the the Chinese leadership itself, but also to the Chinese people. So, for example, Deng Xiaoping, uh, you know, the previous uh, paramount Chinese leader, uh, had um, two reforms during the past 40 years in, in China. And uh, each uh, before each one of them, uh, Deng Xiaoping said, you know, if we don't do reform, uh, the party's rule is going to be jeopardized. We, we can't not rule anymore. And so uh, that's the fundamental reason for them to, to open up. And each time uh, the West, especially America, heeded their request. Uh, I mean, the Chinese Communist Party would say, we, we, we will reform, we need your help. Uh, we were to... Uh, we're too backward. Uh, we wanna do. We wanna be a democratic, or we wanna be a more open society. And each time, uh, the West and Amer America came to help China, and this is why the engagement policy came about. After, I mean, until 1989, the the American uh, elites. Um, I mean, even after the 1989 Tiananmen massacre, uh, the American elite still thinks, oh, China is going to change because Deng Xiaoping said so. After 1989, Deng Xiaoping said, without further reform and opening up, our our, our party cannot rule anymore. And uh, President George H.W. Bush and uh, Clinton uh, both believed him or, you know, pretend to believe him. So they lifted uh, sanctions and uh, uh, launched this engagement policy and China get tremendous help from America. Uh, Clinton helped China to enter WTO and yeah, the rest is MNF status. Right. And so, so, I mean, what should, what, in your view then, what should America be doing at this point? Should we be talking about uh, pushing for a, uh, most favored nation status to be rescinded for China. What 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 should we what should we do we be doing without uh, cutting off our nose to spite our face? I think a order to decouple is needed because if you think about China is unchangeable political politically under the communist rule. So a I mean I'm, I'm not. I think some people are talking about um, get China's uh, WTO status revoked. Uh, I I don't know about that, but for America to orderly decouple with the Chinese economy, that's very important. You know, just uh, let them use their own resources and their own money to re to restructure their economy and let the 
uh, uh, that the quality and strength of our respective institutions uh, decide our positions in the world um, in the in the in the future. Now, like uh, Chinese Ambassador Qin Gang said, he said, you know, if we view the world as a a shared community, and then we have a shared future. This is sound very correct. However, China has been using this excuse to take advantage of of the West and it's America. It's just propaganda. Yeah, it's just propaganda. I yeah. um, the only person who believes that is John Kerry. Um, the uh, so so with respect to with respect to where this goes, is this happening organically? What, what's your sense of what's actually happening there? With, for example. Big American companies moving uh, their supply chains out of China. They may stay in that Southeast Asia, but they're they're moving to Vietnam or, or or other places. Is that having a material impact on the Chinese economy on the regime? Oh yeah, tremendously. Uh, if you think about China's economy, China relies on three things to drive its economy: um, internal consumption, so just let's let's call it consumption, export and uh, investment. So if you think about consumption, like I, what I said, the wealth structure of the Chinese population uh, means that China ha cannot have a real strong consumption because poor, most people are too poor. And uh, if you think about investment, investment means government investment in infrastructure and also, you know, real estate investment in building more and more houses. And those two are, I mean, China has too many horses, houses to, 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 for the people to live in. And China has so many infrastructure that many of them, a, a lot of them are in uh, waste. They're lying ghost towns. So you cannot build anymore. You cannot invest anymore. The real lifeblood is manufacturing export. And that's why, you know, uh, house, I mean, factories, uh, Apple factories in Ch China, uh, Tesla are so so important for China. Now they're exiting China. I think that's a huge blow to Chinese economy. I want to no. go back to something that you said yeah. earlier. I mean, the reason why they lifted their zero COVID policy, wasn't it because they the Chinese government was just simply running out of money to enforce it? Yeah, that's a very, very important reason. So if you think about how much... Uh, the zero COVID cost. China, you know, the the landmark, uh, the landmark uh, thing for zero COVID is uh, the nuclear asset testing. So, if you China before the zero COVID, they do like a forty eight hour, um, forty eight hour nuclear asset testing for all their populations. How much does that cost? That costs two hundred forty three billion dollars a year and that's eight percent of their entire central fiscal revenue <laughs> so they that's could lovely. not sustain it yeah. yeah and that's not even the biggest portion of the cost and then lockdown partial lockdowns of cities cost even more so they yeah. can't sustain that I tell you, they shouldn't have spent all that money on Hunter Biden. Uh, it was a big yeah. mistake. Uh, Simone Gao, journalist and host of Zooming In with Simone Gao, current affairs program on YouTube. Simone, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And she joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. The stories you need to know to start your day. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. It happens every year. Winter. Delivering and receiving supplies and getting people where they need to go can be impossible. Keeping your business's doors and gates working properly to keep out the extreme weather is a major concern. Your business can't afford a loss of income or productivity. Be ready. Call Industrial Door Company of Chicago, Inc. for your commercial door maintenance and security tune-up now. You can't always plan when your doors break down, and it always seems to come at the least convenient time. Industrial Door Company will ensure your doors, grills, gates, and dock equipment are working to specification and give you advice on how to increase the life of your doors. See a range of products and services at industrialdoor.com.